Um, my name is oh, sorry. My name is Katie Millet. I'm with the, the GeoBond Secretariat. I'm a science officer um, in Montreal. And welcome to our webinar on reporting and monitoring genetic diversity with indicators that do not require DNA data. So we'll be recording this webinar. Um, it will be shared and available on GeoBond's YouTube channel later on. We will also share the slides with you. Um, we'll have the active links there with you um, to share there. Um, so for today, just a brief overview of our agenda. We'll be talking about uh, the monitoring framework from the CBD Secretariat. So we'll have Jillian Campbell joining us shortly. We have several talks on genetic diversity indicators, followed by sh four short presentations from countries which are applying genetic diversity indicators now. So we have some examples from Colombia, Japan, Australia, and Mexico. Uh, then we'll follow up with some questions and answer time and some closing remarks and resources that are available for you. Um, for your information, the organizers of this meeting have double zeros in their names if you look in the participants list, so you can get an idea of who's there, and if you have any particular questions, um, we're available, so you can address questions to us specifically if you wish. Um, you can turn your captions on. Um, we do have some to see the transcript available there. Um, and lastly, if you have any quick clarifying questions, please feel free to ask it in the chat. We have some people that can translate in English, French, and Spanish, so or and Portuguese as well. So if you want to ask a question in those languages, you can, and we'll we'll translate it later in our answers. Otherwise, um, we will have time for questions and answers following the Q and A. So you can ask your questions in person if you like. So now um, I'd like to introduce Jillian Campbell from the CB Secretariat, who will say a few words. If Jillian is there. Thank you very much, Katie. Um, I'll start now. I, so I would like to say that I'm actually going to be first giving you an overview of the, the process that has been underway in terms of developing the post-2020 global biodiversity framework and its monitoring framework. I'll keep that very short. And then um, we have together with uh, UNEP WCMC prepared a presentation that describes the monitoring framework. And this would have been given by a, a colleague from UNEP WCMC, but, but she's not here. And so I, um, it's very late in the UK. So I'll also give that presentation. So, um, so that is maybe why my intervention may seem a little disconnected. So to start off with, as I think most of you know, we are moving to the COP15 and in less than a month's time, this will be held in Montreal where the global biodiversity framework will be agreed. The current version of the global bi biodiversity framework, it includes four goals, which represent um, outcome level achievements to 2050. It provides a vision. Um, and this includes uh, genetic diversity as one of the, of the aspects of goal A. And then we also have a set of 22 action-oriented targets, which describe the, what's going to be necessary to take us to these outcomes. And then there are indicators associated with both the goals and the targets that make up part of the or make up the official monitoring framework for the global biodiversity framework. This is something that is uh, new from ACHI. The, ACHI framework did not have an agreed monitoring framework. The indicators were developed much after the targets. Um, and there was, they weren't sort of uniformly used by, by parties. And so this is a, is a major step forward in terms of how we are treating monitoring in the global biodiversity framework. Although the indicators themselves are not agreed and the, and the goals and the targets are also still being discussed, my impression is that there is sort of broad scale recognition of the importance of monitoring and having an agreed monitoring framework that is applicable for all parties. And this is something that we have seen broad scale agreement around. And so, so this I think is a, is a huge step forward. So now if, if you can hold on just a minute, I will try to quickly switch over and, and share my screen and, and share the presentation. Perhaps while I'm in the process of sharing the presentation, I'll mention that after me, um, there will be a presentation on the 
the specific genetic diversity indicators that uh, are being proposed in the global biodiversity framework. And this will be from the, the GBike partnership that has organized this webinar. And so you'll have Sean Colvin and Linda Lakery who will present the, the specific indicators that are, are moving forward in the whole one. So let me share just one second. And maybe while Jillian's just finding her presentation, I'll just give a, a short introduction of our speakers today. So um, who is not joining us, I think today, but um, Cristiano Vernesi from the foundation of Edmund Mach in Italy. He represents the European Cost Action G-Bike. Dr. Dr. Linda Laker from Stockholm University, Sweden, who represents the IUCN Conservation Genetics Specialist Group. We have Sean Hoban of the Morton Arboretum in the States representing Geobon and the Genetic Composition Working Group. Uh, they have worked to clarify genetic diversity concepts, obtain consensus in the scientific community and develop affordable ways to measure genetic erosion. So we're looking forward to hearing all of their presentations and the discussion today. So uh, maybe if you're ready now, Jillian, do you have your slides ready? Have we lost her? So, okay. I'm sharing my screen. You tell me if you're not able to see this. It's good. Just put it in presentation mode. Okay. So, um, the, the framework that we have for, for monitoring the post-2020 global biodiversity framework uh, has been developed over multiple iterations. The first iteration that we had was, was about two years ago and, and didn't have much of a, a logical framework. Um, and then there was a peer review. There was, this has been discussed by an online um, subsidiary body and then an in-person, this is, it's, throughout the process been revised to the point where it is now. And so if you're interested in, in seeing the current version of the monitoring framework, you can see it as one of the COP15 documents. It's um, COP15 slash two, and it's under agenda item nine. And the framework includes three different levels of indicators. It includes headline indicators, which are seen as the, a minimum set of high level indicators for measuring the, the goals and the targets. Um, the, there's currently about 39 of them. And these are indicators that should be both globally and nationally relevant. So rel the importance of being able to aggregate the indicators up for global assessment is something that is a criteria for inclusion at this level. Then there's component level indicators. The component level indicators are uh, similar in that they should be nationally relevant and globally relevant. Uh, however, they perhaps capture a, narrow, a narrower scope of the goals or the targets. Um, and so they're filling gaps. You know, No headline indicator is going to be able to capture the entire scope of a, of a biodiversity issue. And so these component indicators fill gaps in some of the, in some of the headline indicators coverage. And then there's complementary indicators, which are a running list of other indicators that may be useful for different levels of assessment. Um, and a, a additional criteria, which uh, is the case for the genetic diversity indicators as well, is that the data should be publicly available. There should be, um, the methodologies should also be publicly available. There should be a process, including the scientific peer review process that has been used in order to, to reach agreement on the indicator. Um, and, it, and it should be able to be regularly updated. Um, and so, so in this case, uh, all of these things are, are true for many of the indicators that you're going to hear about today. So um, 
The current version of the document that's going forward to COP has been discussed, as I mentioned, through multiple iterations. And most recently, it was discussed at an expert workshop on the indicators in Bonn. Um, you can see the full report of this if you're interested. And this is the basis for, for the monitoring framework that will be discussed at the mm. COP next month. Um, and the, the workshop, I think, you know, this is perhaps a little too much detail, but I will mention that the workshop also considered the capacity requirements and gaps that would be needed in order to operationalize the headline indicators in particular. And I think in terms of this group, um, it's important, obviously the, the countries are interested in feasibility in terms of adopting the headline indicators. At the same time, this is also an opportunity to, to have a dialogue with countries on where do they need to invest in data collection, what's actually needed to make sure that you have a, a monitoring system that works and that gives you relevant information for policy. Um, and so, as I said, the indicators were assessed. I think, again, I'll, I'll skip this. Um, and now this is the indicator list that is going forward to, to COP. And there are, uh, there are headline indicators related to genetic diversity. Um, there's headline indicators related to genetic diversity in goal A, which is this proportion of populations within species with an effective population size um, greater than 500. And additionally, there's a number of uh, other complementary indicators that relate to genetic diversity. So, um, I think that I will leave it at that and hand over to Sean and Linda. Thank you. Yes, so our next speaker is Linda and she's going to tell us what is genetic diversity and why it's important. So when you're ready, Linda. Yes, thank you. Can you see the slides? Yes. Hey, great. Thank you very much for this opportunity. Thanks for joining our webinar. So when we talk about biodiversity, we often focus on species and ecosystems. And we all know that if a species goes extinct, this can have devastating effects also for entire ecosystems. But in addition to this level, these two levels, we also have genetic diversity. And that originates in variation at the DNA level that builds up into genes occurring in different variants. I use colors to symbolize these gene variants. And we have genetic diversity within populations and between populations. So, and, and the, this between population component is often reflects genetic adaptations to local environmental conditions. And genetic diversity is the toolbox for evolution and adaptation and long-term survival. So it's a key, particularly in these times with rapid environmental changes. And when specific genetically distinct populations goes extinct, that can have similar effects as when we see species going extinct. So genetic diversity within species is equally important to consider as species diversity. And our focus here is naturally occurring genetic variation within and between populations that's necessary for survival and resilience. And Important to stress that we are not focusing on, on genetically modified organisms or any other kind of manipulations, but rather naturally occurring variation. And it's been shown from decades of scientific research that high genetic diversity, again symbolized with colors here, is connected to high adaptive capacity, good potential for long-term survival, and high resilience, whereas the opposite goes for low genetic diversity. Populations which have been where the genetic diversity has declined show low adaptive capacity and weak potential for long term survival and low resilience. There are many examples of these connections and we have policy briefs where you can read more. One example for, high, for the importance of genetic diversity comes from corals and a recent study showing that warmer ocean temperatures corals being able to sustain in such environment that's associated to genetic diversity. Diversity within species has helped populations to be able to, to survive in these conditions. And whereas we have an example of a 
populations being depleted of genetic diversity, strongly isolated wolf population on an island on an island in Lake Michigan. Over a few decades, they lost viability and the population totally collapsed due to inbreeding effects and removal of variation. Another important example from a marine environment as well, and again, a habitat forming species, kelp outside Australia showed low genetic diversity areas were strongly affected by a marine heat wave. Moderate genetic diversity areas showed partly effect, affected by this heat wave, whereas high genetic diversity areas were not affected or very moderately affectable. Recent scientific studies showing this connection. So genetic diversity is important and processes that can result in loss of genetic diversity is, can be divided into four key types. So when we lose a genetically distinct population, that means loss of genetic variation. If we look within populations, if the population is too small, that this will result in loss of genetic variation within a population. And we have human induced selection. So when we harvest individuals from the wild, and when we remove individuals, if, if, if they have characteristics that genetically de determined, we, that means we will select against those genes and we will remove them from the gene pool, also resulting in loss of genetic variation. And finally, situations where we have a natural population that's adapted to its environment, and then we start to release something with a ge different genetic composition. This can alter, harm the, the natural gene pool and remove the, the adapted population. So these are four mechanisms of loss and you need indicators to monitor them. And our indicator one, that the NE indicator currently suggested as a headline indicator focuses on this within population component. Indicator two, concerns maintaining populations of within species. And our third indicator, which for that one, you need genetic data can, can detect these types of processes. Looking at this situation now within populations, we can envision this shape looking like an olive and considering the green area of this olive as the number of mature individuals, whereas the red area is how the population behaves genetically. So NC is the number of mature individuals and NE is how the population acts, the genetically affected population size. And as shown in this picture here, NE is often much smaller than what census size is, but it's NE that determines the rate of loss. So it's that parameter that is extremely important for within population maintenance of genetic diversity. So, we need to know how fast a population loses genetic diversity, and we need to know if a population is large enough to maintain sufficient levels for adaptive capacity and effective size NE will provide the answer. And you can, you can estimate NE from molecular genetic data, but you can also use our proxy indicator, which does not need genetic data. So, and we build our indicator on this well-established and scientifically accepted rule of thumb that when you have an effective size that's larger than 500, this will maintain sufficient levels of genetic variation to allow for adaptations. So the, the indicator that we propose is, is the proportion of populations within species where the effective size is over 500 and as we, heard from Gillian, this is now proposed as an headline indicator. And we, the proxy we suggest is to use what we know from, sci from scientific studies that the ratio of NE to NC is typically around 0.1. So typically NE is about 10% out of census size. So that's what we should suggest to use as a proxy. When we have, if we want to reach NE 500, we can use census size, number of mature individuals of 5,000. And by that, I thank you very much for your attention. And I hand over to Sean Hoban to talk more on goals, targets, and these indicators. Thank you very much. Thank you, Linda. Just to remind our participants, if you would like to turn on the captions, you can click um, live transcript CC in your Zoom, and then you will see the English captions. 
maybe that will be easier for some people. Um, we do have translators, but they're mostly for translating the questions. But translators, if you would like to summarize major points, um, please do so in the chat. But I'm sorry, we don't have a live translation of, of all of the speakers. So I will share my screen. Thank you for coming, everyone. My name is Sean Hoban. I'm speaking on behalf of a large, diverse group of conservationists and scientists who have developed genetic diversity indicators for the post-2020 framework. As you know, genetic diversity is an important part of goal A and target four of the draft one GBF. As Dr. Liker just explained, genetic diversity within and among populations of species is vital for survival. It helps species adapt to environmental and climate change and pests and diseases, especially in a time of changing environments and climate. It makes ecosystems more resilient to extreme weather and disturbances, and it supports ecosystem services, nature's contributions to people, and the success of habitat restoration all depend on ultimately on genetic diversity. How can we maintain genetic diversity and ensure that species can adapt? There are three main things we can do. We can maintain sufficiently large population that is an effective size of 500, preventing the loss of genetic diversity within populations. We can prevent the loss of distinct populations and the traits that are found within distinct populations, such as color morphs. And if possible, we can monitor with DNA high priority species and use that knowledge for managing them. This has led to the development of three genetic diversity indicators. The proportion of populations or breeds within species with effective size above 500, the proportion of distinct populations maintained that is not lost, and the number of species and populations where genetic diversity is monitored using DNA methods. There are important other complementary indicators, such as the genetic scorecard developed by Scotland, which are very useful as well, but we won't have time to speak about them today. Parties have uh, made comments and given input to these in indicators over the past uh, couple of years. Comments from May 2021, uh, more than 21 comments supported one or more of these indicators. While analyses from an input from the Geneva and Bonn meetings this year were generally supportive, but parties wish to know more about feasibility, data availability, and relevance of these indicators. And we will focus on that today. So I will explain each one. The proportion of populations with an effective size greater than 500. It is relevant to conserving genetic diversity. This is sufficiently large to prevent genetic erosion. As you can see in this graphic, once a population is above NE500, loss of genetic diversity over time is very low to none. Once the population is below NE500, genetic diversity loss starts to accelerate and become very dramatic over time. So maintaining NE500 prevents genetic erosion and inbreeding and helps populations maintain adaptive capacity. This should be understandable by many CBD stakeholders because the concept of effective population size was previously used for threatened breeds. Indeed, for over 30 years, agricultural breeds have been designated as threatened based on thresholds of NE. So this uh, and um, this has been the basis of an indicator on genetic resources. So this is a concept that we are connecting to previous work by CBD. This is measurable. Uh, the effective size generally can be estimated as about one-tenth of the census size. The census size can be found, and we will give you many examples throughout the webinar today of where to find this information, it can be found in species management reports from government or private conservation organizations, from the Red List assessment reports, from citizen science counts, or from area of suitable habitat. The next indicator, the proportion of distinct populations maintained. This is relevant, of course, because we know that populations are adapted to different environments 
cold, heat, different light uh, availability, nutrients, predators, uh, pests, disease, environmental conditions. Maintaining these genetic adaptations allows the species options for survival. And this should be understandable because people can see these adaptations and the consequences of not having the right adaptations. This is also measurable. It's simply a measure of lost populations, which can be found in similar species management reports, red list assessment reports, sometimes national databases, national census. And you'll see some examples of that from some of the countries deploying these indicators in a few minutes, habitat maps, GBIF, and again, citizen science data. And you'll see examples of all of these. Again, we know it's not possible in all countries at present, but when possible, monitoring directly priority species populations with DNA-based methods can provide knowledge for management. So such knowledge can inform when and how to do translocations and when and how to reintroduce or plant trees. This is a fairly easy to report on indicator as it is just the count of such uh, species that have this kind of monitoring available. We'll focus mostly on the first two indicators, the NE500 and the populations maintained indicator. Importantly, this is not expected for all species in the country. In fact, um, reporting on 100 or more species is a good basis for this in for these two indicators. And again, we'll show examples in a few minutes. Here's one example. This is a species endemic to the United States. Here's a map of its distribution and census counts that were from an endangered species management report. So we can see that from such reports, there's quantifiable information on population size and current and historic populations. This has already been compiled by local experts and is already published, freely available data. Um, we are leveraging existing in-country data and expertise uh, for reporting on these indicators. These would be the values of the indicators for this species. How many species actually have such data available? You might imagine, of course, that not all species would have such knowledge existing. The Swedish Environmental Protection Agency recently evaluated how many species have the data available. They looked at over 22,000 species in their country, all native species, uh, to see if red list reports would have relevant data. They found that about one third of species have some census counts available, and about 20% of species have some range data available. And this is the type of data needed for reporting on these indicators. So certainly not all species, but for this country, thousands of species have this data available. The Swedish EPA then actually calculated indicators for 79 species in mammals and reptiles. I'll just mention mammals due to time limits. Mammal populations, over half of all mammal populations likely have effective size less than 500, and a large proportion of mammal populations are being lost. 3% of species actually have genetic studies available. To calculate data availability and to actually calculate the indicators took uh, one person about six months. And as we'll mention in this webinar, we are developing tools and workflows to make this easier and faster such that it is entirely feasible. Importantly, genetic indicators have captured a conservation concern genetic losses at a really massive scale that would otherwise not be documented. We are now testing, uh, deploying these indicators with partners in nine countries. And importantly, we are working with personnel from the biodiversity agencies of these countries to ensure that these indicators are put to, and the knowledge gained from them is put to practical conservation use. And you will hear from some of these representatives today. I'll mention concerns and questions. We've given over a dozen webinars, participated in several CBD events, and corresponded with many CBD stakeholders over the past three years. And these are some of your questions. Is DNA data needed? Not for the NE500 or the population's maintained indicator. You only need census and population data. Is there enough data? 
as you will see with examples from countries today, there should be data available for hundreds of species per country. How time consuming is it? Currently, we estimate it would take about one month and three people working on this every four to five years, which is the time uh, span of periodic reporting. Is it flexible? Yes, as you'll see, a diversity of data sources, reports, local knowledge, uh, interviews, existing in-country databases and surveys can be used. And by leveraging existing national biodiversity resources, we can save time and money and make these indicators uh, rather feasible. We also want to point out that the indicators are useful beyond CBD reporting. So they are not just for reporting, but the NE500, the uh, populations maintained, and the DNA monitoring can help inform decisions about species management. So actually having uh, practical use. And we see an alignment with the Red List process. Gathering data for these indicators could take place during Red List workshops or Red List updates. And so, uh, indeed making compilation of the indicators even faster. This is where we are now. We've been doing this for the past two years, working with partners uh, in different countries. We will be scaling up to more countries next year and creating more resources and doing training in multiple languages. We look forward to your participation, your suggestions and improvement over time to make them easier and better. I want to close by pointing out that these indicators are connected to goal A and target for wording from the most recent informal group recommendations. Option one, goal A recommended by the informal working group, genetic diversity and adaptive potential within populations of species is maintained, can be reported on using indicator one populations NE500. Again, this helps maintain genetic diversity within population giving each population the ability to quickly respond to changing conditions and adapt. Genetic diversity and adaptive potential of all distinct populations are maintained. So all distinct, genetically distinct populations are maintained, very connected to the proportion of populations maintained indicator. Again, this conserves among population genetic diversity, distinct adaptations to different locations to give the entire species options for the future. Option two, goal A from the informal group is not as specific. Uh, it's a little more vague, but these indicators can still be used for reporting on maintaining genetic diversity and adaptive potential. As for target four, maintain and restore the genetic diversity within and between populations of all species and maintain their adaptive potential, including through in situ and ex situ conservation. All of the indicators can be used, including this one on DNA based monitoring because that informs restoration and management. The genetic scorecard and other complementary indicators are also connected to target four. So reference to maintenance of genetic diversity within and among populations is a vital part of the GBF. Um, and the indicators are connected to current wording for goal A and target four. I close by saying that the indicators are smart, specific, measurable, achievable, relevant, and time bound. They are sensitive to genetic changes. They are useful, feasible, scalable, have data available, and are garnering party interest. And we'll see now in a few presentations um, from our participants, our colleagues, our partners, um, presenting their work in deploying these indicators. And first, we will have Dr. Catherine Gruber from Australia. Excuse me. Thank you, Sean. Uh, first, I acknowledge and pay respect to the traditional owners of the land from which I'm speaking with you, the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation, and I pay my respect to the First Nations people from the regions where you are based. This presentation is about a research project to calculate the CBD genetic biodiversity indicators for Australian species. It's being co-led by myself, Rebecca Jordan, and Anna McDonald. This research was initiated from Geobond working group discussions and includes scientists from multiple Australian universities and government agencies, according to relevant subject matter expertise. 
Australia is an isolated continent and is a country of very high endemism and a wide range of ecosystems. In fact, it's a mega diverse country that may be well known for its charismatic marsupials such as koala, but many fascinating and unique plants and animals call Australia home. Biodiversity threats and conservation strategies in Australia are as diverse as the species and ecosystems of the country, which range from tropical reef to sandy desert, from temperate forest to alpine grassland. Uh, yes, sorry, <laughs> alpine grassland. Land, land use change, introduced invasive species, and population fragmentation are common threats to Australian species. And habitat restoration and translocations are key conservation strategies. Many landscapes have been de designated as terrestrial and marine protected areas, as exemplified in this map published by the Australian government. Here in Australia, there is a great deal of ongoing research to understand the threats to local species and develop conservation strategies, including genetic threats compiled by local experts. So in our pilot research project, we'll calculate the diversity indicators by targeting publicly available data the scientific literature that will inform our genetic indicator calculations includes both multi-species assessments and species or population level information. We will also use appendices to the Australian Government's Environmental Protection and Biodiversity Act, which includes general species assessments, plus recovery plans and action plans for vulnerable species. State government reports can also inform our indicators. For example, the New South Wales Government Assessment of All Vascular Plants and the Victorian Genetic Risk Index, which includes over a thousand species of plants and animals. IUCN Red List assessments can also be informative for this project and citizen science observations available through iNaturalist and the Atlas of Living Australia. We acknowledge that by using only publicly available data, there may be shortcomings and biases in the information that we can generate, but we expect that due to the high quality genetic and ecological biodiversity research in Australia, we will be in a good position to calculate indicators for a wide range of species relatively quickly. And by collaborating with our colleagues in other countries who are generating similar data in different ways, we can contribute to the full picture of the merits of various methods for calculating the indicators. For this pilot study, we will target a semi-random curated sample of species. Our team includes researchers with expertise in Australian mammals, birds, reptiles, plants, invertebrates, and marine ecosystems. And from that broad expertise, our data will cover a range of taxonomic groups, targeting in particular species across a range of Australian ecosystems and habitats. We're especially interested in making sure that we can capture examples of uniquely Australian species, and especially those with unique life history strategies, such as marsupials, monotremes like the platypus and desert, ad desert adapted species and so on. And in relation to conservation values, we're targeting both threatened and non-threatened species, as well as charismatic and less well-known species. So let's look at two examples. The first example I'd like to talk about is the numbat, which is an endangered termitivorous marsupial. There are currently 10 populations, two remnant and eight reintroduced. There are very good population size estimates or carrying capacity estimates for most of these populations, or at least trends for most of them. And this species has been the focus of genetic research, including genetic data based on microsatellites, mitochondrial DNA, and more recently a genome project. So the indicators here are uh, indicator one, zero, indicator two, populations remaining 0 0.9, and indicator three gets one because genetic research is being conducted. The next example is a spiny rice flower, which is a critically endangered grassland shrub. The species has had significant loss of habitat over the last 200 years, and what remains is very fragmented. There have been genetic studies of this species as well, including microsatellite and chloroplast DNA studies. So the indicators for this species are uh, again zero for indicator one, uh, 0.2 of pop for populations remaining, and uh, one for genetic studies being conducted. Looking ahead to the next steps, this month we're bringing together a workshop to test and generate data for the CBD indicators, which is being hosted by myself and supported by my research fellowship at the University of Sydney. The objective is to bring together in person biologists from academia and government research organizations, according to their disciplinary expertise, to generate a large data set of genetic indicators. 
We expect that most species will take approximately an hour to assess, um, but of course some will be much less and some more. And the timeline for the generation of our pilot data is expected by the end of January 23. I thank you for the opportunity to share our research and I will hand over now to our next speaker. Thanks, Catherine. So our next speaker is Victor, and he's going to talk to us about examples of this indicator in Colombia. Victor, floor is yours. I'm going to turn my screen. In a moment, please. Okay, can you see my presentation? Yes, looks good. Yes. Okay. Hello, everyone. My name is Victor Rincon. I am a Colombian researcher, and I will to tell you about the progress that we have made for Colombia in estimating the genetic diversity indicators. Mm, I want to start this presentation to take you about Colombia. Uh, Colombia is one of the most biodiverse countries in the world because it has great diversity of ecosystem types. And for this reason, in Colombia, there is a great richness of species. And this configure its territory as a mega diversity place. Therefore, Colombia has a great responsibility towards global conservation objectives. Actually, uh, Colombia is committed to actions that help, that help to adapt to the climate crisis, environment sustainable, and protect biodiversity. And for this, the country is aligned with the global goals for managing the, clim the climate crisis and biodiversity laws, in which the management of genetic diversity is essential. Therefore, the use of clear genetic indicators with a robust scientific foundation and accessible and relevant indicators to measure is very important for the environment management of the country. Mm, we have a species selection matrix to, to evaluate these indicators. And for the selection of species that we evaluate, we follow the same framework developed by our colleagues. So from a list of thousand possible species, we should be select those with better population information. And this means that we must choose species with high quality population data. Mm, here is important to highlight that Colombia has made an impressive progress in organizing and publishing national open data networks on biodiversity in which experts don't validation of species records and population to ensure their quality. Therefore, our, our sources information are the Biodiversity Colombia data networks and national and global release, and of course, sci scientific literature. Mm, the Biodiversity Colombia data networks is a system of monitor, report, and action in which organizations upload their data and taxonomic experts review and validate it information. And this is done with the main idea of generating of species distribution models, but also allows for high quality population data. So we use this validated data as first step to research about species population information. From this, uh, so we generate a list of 100 species to evaluate. Now we have estimated the indicator for 36 species, and we are collecting population information of the remaining 64 species. Um, we have organized the workflow of data organization and the indicator estimation in, in our script, and we hope to share it when, when we finish the, the pilot project. Mm, I'm going to to talk about some examples uh, for specific species. Uh, here we have some example of species for which we estimate the, the indicator. Um, the first example is an amphibian. This, um, the species is Osornorifer percrasa, that is an endemic species of Colombia with a population located exclusively in Colombian and the mountains, and that is vulnerable of extinction and is classified of, as of restricted because it has a very small distribution range. In this case, the species is recorded in two populations. One has the effective number and the other no. The other no, no have the, the threshold. So the indicator is 0 0.05. Uh, in the case of the second indicator, uh, there are no records about the extinct population of this species. So the indicator two is one. 
Um, there are, and about the third indicator, there are no population with genetic data uh, of this species. Another example is, is this, is, is a lizard, Anolis maculiventris, uh, for which the first indicator is, one, is 0 0.02, and the second indicator is 0 0.08, because there are reports about one extinct population. And in this example, the last example is the Orinoco goose, for which first indicator is zero because their population are small and do not meet the thresholds. So this have zero in the, in the, in the first indicators and one in the indicator two because there are no reports about extinct populations. Uh, finally, uh, these are the overall results about our analysis. Um, is the, the, the summary is with the 36 species and this is the, the mean of the of the indicators. Um, I would like to finish to tell you that we have finished this analysis in January. Uh, we have to complete the 64 remaining species in, in, in December and, and January according to the, the, the review of literature. And I want to highlight that the population data obtained for this work is applicable to other initiatives, as for example, key biodiversity areas, living planet index, or real estimation, because it's uh, information about uh, population species that is very important. And for example, the, the research that provides population training pues, is, 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 is more data, and more data is, is needed in, in, in this moment. Mm, I'm, I'm going to finish uh, because uh, uh, this research is supported by the government of Colombia, and I am going to play a video from the Colombia environmental mystery. Okay, so we don't have the time to, to run the video now. Uh, uh, maybe later. Okay, don't worry. To, to okay, in the next moment. In the next moment. Thank you. Sorry. Okay, don't worry. Okay. Um, okay. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. And the next speaker is Fumiko from Japan. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I am Fumiko Ishihama from National Institute for Environmental Studies, Japan. And I will introduce about ge the genetic indicator calibration test in, in Japan. Japan is an island country with a large number of endemic species and the conservation of genetic diversity is generally limited to critically endangered species and some useful wood species. Meanwhile, Ministry of the Environment of Japan is preparing the next national biodiversity strategy. Thus, this is an outstanding opportunity to mainstream the conservation of genetic diversity and to incorporate it into a monitoring framework. For these purposes, realistic genetic indicators and methodologies for calculations are needed. In Japan, genetic data is relatively well accumulated for plant, fishes, and mammals, but these data exist in scattered manner. By the way, the indicators suggested by Hoban et al. 2020 does not require genetic data, but can be calculated from census size. Census size data is well organized for endangered plants and Statistical estimate of census size is available for common tree species. Thus, we start from indicator calculation from plant species and gradually expand to other taxonomic groups. This is an example of records for population size for red list plants. Census size was recorded in size classes in 10 kilometer grid to define a population, those the distribution data is in 10 kilometer grids. We sum up multiple grids based on the spatial ability of each species. For example, Aster Cantoensis 
which is an endemic aster in gravel floodplains in three rivers. We treat records within the river system as a population. Two rivers each have one large record whose median size is above 5,000, and uh, but another river have only small records. Thus, the indi indicator one is two thirds, and indicator two is uh, three thirds for Asta Cantuensis. This is a summary of our species selection matrix for red list plants. This result shows the red list data sets covers a wide range of habitat types, life histories, and including both endemic and transboundary species. Based on this species selection matrix, we will select the species to calculate the index. And this is a preliminary results of indicator one for all endangered species before species selection. In general, red list plants have very small values of indicator one, which is less than 0 0.2. And uh, next to the red list plants, we are going to calculate indexes for common tree species. For this calculation, we use estimated depopulation size based on presence absence records in vegetation survey plus range map. Such population size estimation is possible if there is a sufficient number of plots, which means several plots per a cell to estimate the population size. So in conclusion, Indicator calculation is possible based on size class data and also from presence absence plus range map data. Thank you. And the next our speaker, please. Thank you very much, Fumiko. I'm Alicia Mastreta from Mexico, and now I'm also going to give another presentation. Can you confirm if you are seeing my screen in presentation mode? Yes. Okay, so yes. I'm talking on behalf of Conavio from Mexico uh, and on behalf of many people from within Conavio, but also from students and researchers from other institutions in the country. To provide you some context about where I am from, Mexico is a mega diverse and very large country. We have several types of very different ecosystems ranging from deserts to rainforests. We are also a center of origin and domestication of several important crops, which means that we have crop wild relatives and also wild populations that are somehow managed and also domesticated species. We are a very topographically heterogeneous area and a tropical latitude, which means that populations of species were able to persist and therefore accumulate genetic diversity through the recent uh, climate changes of the Earth. For these reasons, choosing a species selection for Mexico is particularly challenging. But what we are doing is that we are uh, complementing experts' suggestions and Conavia suggestions of species that are representative of all of Mexico major ecosystems that include also crop-wide relatives of our species of interests. And we are also making a mixture of species that have data already available at the genetic level or especially at the abundance level with also a subset of the priority species that were defined previously for the country. And we are including major taxonomic groups, contrasting dispersal abilities and different forms of reality. I'm gonna focus on um, species, uh, although we have several different kinds of data sources, uh, ranging from very detailed genetic monitoring programs from, for some corporate relatives, to citizen science data or records from national species assessments. I'm gonna to focus today in some of the species for which we don't have um, 
detailed abundance data or detailed genetic studies. As an example, I'm gonna focus on Juniperus monticola. This is a shrub that grows at very high elevation mountains in central Mexico. Um, and for this species, we have occurrence data based on collections, which you can see in purple in the map, and also uh, from citizen science records, which you can see in orange in the map. We don't have uh, good uh, data on the census size of each of the populations, but we can ask local experts, which include from botanists to naturalists to local inhabitants of these places. So what we are doing first is that for indicator two, which is a proportion of populations maintained, we first check which populations have been historically recorded and has been seen recently in the last 15 years. And we recorded these populations as currently existing. Then, and we, you can see them in green. Then for populations that haven't been recorded in the area in decades and where their local habitat has been destroyed based on satellite images, which you can see on Google Earth, for example, we recorded these populations as probably extinct. Um, for populations where that, that we have records but haven't been seen, but where the habitat seems to be still there, we just record these populations as unknown. So based on this, for Juniperus monticola example, we have two extinct populations and 15 extant populations. For indicator one, which is a proportion of population with an effective population size higher than 500, as I told you, we don't have genetic data to estimate this, and we don't have real census data of the populations, but we can ask local people, naturalists or botanists, if they know an estimate of the approximate census size for each population. And we recorded it based on this very um, general ranges. If the population is less than 5,000 individuals by much, maybe just a couple of individuals left, or if it is definitely larger than 5,000 individuals, maybe there is 10,000 individuals, or if it is close or a little bit less or a little bit more than 5,000 individuals. Um, um, we also have for this data a genetic study, but this is just a phylogeographic study, so we cannot consider this as genetic monitoring. So in summary, for this species, for the indicator one, we found that four populations have a larger than 5,000 census size approximately. So that's a higher than 500 uh, effective population size. Seven have a lower population size. And for four, for four we couldn't currently uh, contact any local people who have abundant data. So for indicator one, that will be four out of 11 populations with a larger effective size of 500. For indicator two, we recorded that 15 out of 17 populations exist still and indicator three will be zero. So as you can see in this example, you don't really need to have great databases and fantastic data sets to be able to answer these indicators. In summary, uh, our workflow in Mexico is to work with experts, and by experts, I mean botanists, zoologists, biologists, but also local people, citizen scientists, and any people that can have data on the abundance of local populations. We are assessing the species, therefore, based on different data sources, and we are systematizing this data with our colleagues from other countries, hoping that this can become an indicator and a way of contributing to the monitoring of biodiversity in our countries. Thank you very much. I'm going to quickly switch hats now, and I'm going to mention briefly uh, the tools that we have been developing in the team of the several countries presenting today. Very briefly, as you know, when you are collecting data across different countries like with different people, it can be very messy. 
So therefore, we created a series of online tools that can allow to facilitate and standardize the data collection across all of the teams. Briefly, this is a web form, uh, which I wanna show you briefly and some guidance documents that explain step-by-step -step how to create your species list, but also how to estimate each of the indicators based on the type of data you have. And we also created a Google Ulcers groups when all of us are answering questions uh, quickly. Uh, all of them are collected in this address, which I'm gonna paste in the, um, in the chat. Uh, and briefly, I'm gonna show you how the web form looks. This web form is an example of how it will look to fill the data from the species I show you. So we have the assessor and country information. We have the species taxonomy information. Uh, and then uh, we have, for instance, questions that you can use point and click to type the kind of data that you have. And then, uh, for instance, I'm going to put here um, the name of the populations that I have. And then I can answer what kind of uh, population it is. And as you can see, it will open different questions depending on your previous uh, answers. So uh, that's it uh, from me. And again, all these resources are available. And the objective is that the data that we are collecting together, uh, it's comparable across countries. Thank you very much. Thank you, Alicia. That's really fascinating. And thanks to all of our speakers uh, showing us those examples across the, uh, different countries. Um, so now we, we might open the floor up to some questions. If there's anyone that has a question they'd like to ask in person, just please raise your hand. Um, I think we had one in the chat. If there's no one raising their hand at the moment, um, is it all right if I read it now to you? So we have a question from Sushil who asks, is there any way to develop species slash genetic diversity indicators in collaboration with indigenous peoples and local communities who may have bioindicators or indigenous science-based indicators that are relevant to the species? So Alicia, maybe you can kick us off. And from your talk, you had some examples, um, but is there anything additional you'd like to add or is anyone of our other speakers that would like to add to this question? Um, just quickly, uh, I didn't mention it in my talk to leave it here, uh, but for the population's questions and for all the questions really, we are highlighting a data source as expert or local knowledge. And uh, we are not only getting that knowledge, but we are also recording who gave us that information. So the people who is being part of the assessment is also uh, recorded in the form, in this case, in the COBA form. So therefore, this, this can include, of course, their, their names, their contacts, and of course, they agree to do, to do so. So they are not anonymous providers. This is what I want to highlight. Would any of our other speakers like to chime in? Ivan? Yes, there was uh, Ramon who mentioned that he works on Ecuador and there's a problem of funding in Ecuador to protect the biodiversity. Uh, so, well, uh, the, the thing I want to say, I, I said on the chat box in English, is that with these indicators that uh, doesn't necessarily need uh, genetic uh, data for been estimated, we can try to use data that already exists in other databases. And the idea is also to try to help countries that maybe have uh, uh, less uh, funding or resources to do that, to make this more uh, feasible and usable and applicable by all the countries, even those that uh, are uh, funding some uh, problems to generate this genetic data. So this is one of the ways we are trying to to, to, to improve, to, to get these indicators more accessible to, to everyone. Maybe Alicia wants to add something uh, to this. Uh, just quickly, I also mentioned it in, in the chat. Uh, we also believe that it's important to highlight 
the population uh, data or the population assessment, because some species may be wide ranging and therefore not be considered as population concern uh, or as species of conservation concern, or might not be endangered globally. But when we see what is going on with the populations within a particular region or a particular country, therefore we can realize that uh, if we lose that population, we will be losing a lot. And that, for that reason, we believe that including local populations of local communities can be very helpful for them to um, have more arguments for the need to conserve their territories. Thank you. If there are no other questions, I think Sean, um, we get a couple frequently asked questions. Um, are there a few points that you want to make that maybe are not highlighted yet? Yes, uh, actually, we prepared uh, in advance a frequently asked questions slide, and I will share that. And they are just four, I will just do four brief ones. We have more but I will do four quick ones. Many people ask how many species, and I just want to repeat. The scientific goal is to conserve genetic diversity within all species, but reporting the indicator values based on a representative sample that is representing different habitat types, taxonomy, and commonness or rarity of about 100 species or more is good for reporting these indicators. So this is what representative means. People ask, uh, are we ready to do this now? As you can see from the examples, our trial deployment of these indicators for 100 species per country should be done for eight or nine countries by January. And so this is really ready for deployment in 2023. How often is reporting? Four to five years is a good amount. It is consistent with the CBD reporting time period. It is also the time scale on which environmental change and genetic change and population changes usually happen. Ambitious countries may also compile the indicators more frequently, such as every two years. Do the indicators involve digital sequence information. This is a common uh, confusion at the CBD meetings, and these genetic diversity indicators do not involve any DSI. No DSI is reported. Only thing reported is the counts of populations meeting the effective size or populations maintained threshold. So only the counts and proportions of populations, only those are reported. Uh, there is this indicator on genetic studies, but again, this is also only a count of such studies or a count of such species with studies, and no DSI is shared when reporting these indicators. That's it. Just those are a few common questions. We have more, but um, if anyone else uh, has questions, go ahead. If there are no further questions, um, we'd like to ask you a few questions of our own for you. Um, so going back to the Mentimeter, um, we had an additional question about after maybe hearing these talks or from your own perspective, um, do you feel that with guidance and support, you could report on genetic diversity indicators? So given maybe what you've known so far, or maybe in your own experience, do you think this is feasible? So the options are yes, yes, maybe, unsure, no, maybe, or no. So again, uh, the chat, I think, had the link to the Mentimeter. Otherwise, if you just go to menti.com and put in that code number that's at the top of the screen. Um, Kathy, 
We have a good question on the uh, chat. Um, I think it's worth mentioning it. Uh, Francisca yeah. Valenzuela, uh, she's asking if to report these indicators, uh, one has to be part of a given institution, university or something. Any one of the team would like to answer that? Go ahead, Yvonne. So I think there's no need to be uh, really on, on one uh, inst particular institution. Uh, uh, these indicators have been developed to to uh, for the CBD for reporting for the CBD. But uh, these indicators can be used by other uh, uh, for other reporting. Uh, uh, things or it can be even thought to to be used by uh, some enterprises also to monitor the impact uh, this is something that we can we will think in the future but at the moment it's just for for the cbd but any anyone can use if uh, if things that are useful uh, for other things uh, even if they are not uh, people working on a university or or, or for a ministry People from ministries uh, can also use it for report. So it's not mandatory to be uh, an academic or. Yes, Alicia, go ahead. Uh, Jeff, Francisca, uh, you can contact us to if you want to report them. Um, we're going to drop our, our emails there and they are available elsewhere. I also pasted uh, a link where we are uh, linking to the different resources we have created as a group and which are gonna be summarized uh, in a moment, but you can have a look at the guides and a dummy version of the Cobo form there if you want to have more details. Any other questions in the chat? No. Oh. So we have a message from Sylvain Gatti. As a parting message, would you be able to show again the slide debunking the preconceived hurdles into reporting the proposed indicators? I think it's a great message to help nudge whoever's hesitating. Um, so was that the slide I think that Sean you had? Yes, sure. I can do this. Um... I think, uh, yes, so one moment. Okay, so these were common questions or concerns or worries. Um, people wonder if there is enough. So is DNA data needed? No. For the NE500 and populations maintained indicator, no DNA data needed or reported. Is there enough data? As I hope you see, from our examples today, there should be enough data for species in each country. The time commitment we think is quite small for reporting on an entire facet of biodiversity uh, and a major component of goal A and target four. We think this is a moderate uh, amount of time. And I hope you saw from the examples, it's very flexible and can leverage biodiversity resources that countries have already invested very strongly in. So I hope that helps address some of the concerns. And it was very nice to see the results of the Mentimeter poll already. Um, yeah, thanks for filling that out as well. So should we show the a next poll or do you want to um, have some other closing statements, Sean? What do you think? I think uh, please go ahead with the um, the next polls, okay. and then, then we will play a couple of videos of representatives of countries and what they have to say about these indicators, and then we will close with a few slides on resources and where you can find us in Montreal. Okay, uh, Linda, do you have something you want to add? Yeah, I just wanted to highlight Francisca's com comment here in the chat that we welcome other countries and other other 
partners to join us in these efforts. So, so we are happy to help out countries to start monitoring these indicators. So please, please contact us if you want to join our team. Thanks. Yeah, absolutely. We're ready to help if we can. Um, so again, the Menti question now, this is a sort of a word cloud question. In keywords, what are your challenges or needs to implement the genetic diversity indicators? So you have, I think, three options you can fill in. If you agree with something you already see on the screen, you can sort of vote for that word too. And we might see if that's a common concern for many people. So far, it looks like the presence of data is a challenge, also the having the expertise and the spatial distribution mode. I'm not sure I, I know what you mean by that. The spatial scales of implementing the indicator. Uh, maybe if whoever made that comment, they want to explain or put a message in the chat for us. We have two new ones, support and time. Knowledge of genetics. Indigenous buy-in, blend of disciplines. Governments who are not on board. Well, if it's a headline indicator, they're gonna to have to be, I, I think they'll have to report on it. Time seems to be a big one. So um, some listeners may think this is an indicator that will take a lot of time to implement, but I think with a, a certain team, it's not so time consuming, but as Sean described. <sighs> guidance, academic knowledge, human resources. Yeah, so Sean said this is very helpful for us to understand your challenges and needs so that we can position ourselves better. And maybe I'll ask another question. What do you see as advantages of the indicators in a keyword again? Um, if you have the data, is that an advantage? If you're already going to be collecting species information, then maybe you can be implementing this indicator at the same time. So it's it's say it's more efficient or it's saving efforts. Are there any advantages you see to the genetic indicators we talked about today? I think something that it's been reiterated is that it doesn't need genetic data. So if you don't have a lab, you don't have to worry about that. Okay, so some advantages, local knowledge, disaggregated data, species specific. Okay. Applies to existing data, easy to understand, simple, <laughs> local, local knowledge. Great, this is all very helpful understandable
Okay, and with that, we have one last question to ask you, and that's the flip side of that. So in keywords, what do you see as disadvantages of the indicators? So it might be similar to what you've already expressed in your concerns, perhaps. Funding, someone put in the chat. Misunderstanding. So give this one about 30 seconds and then we're going to ask Adriana if she can play us of one of the recorded videos we had from our speaker from Sweden. Okay, so thank you everyone for this. This is very helpful information for us. Um, this is, yeah, again, always very useful. So now I will just pass it over to Adriana. I'll stop sharing and she will play us a message from our speaker from Sweden. Greetings. I am Johan Arbenius at the Swedish Environmental Protection Agency and also the Swedish Substa Focal Point. I will be part of Sweden's delegation to COP15, being also a part of the European Union and its member states in the upcoming negotiations. To me, it is obvious that genetic diversity is vital for supporting the resilience of species and ecosystems in a changing world. Genetic diversity allows species and populations to adapt to new climate conditions and new diseases, among other challenges. We must maintain genetic diversity within and among populations. And the EU supports a strong and clear goal and target for genetic diversity of all species. The indicators being discussed today can help ensure that species and populations maintain genetic diversity, uh, maintaining or restoring effective population sizes of 500 will maintain genetic diversity within populations and maintenance of existing populations will maintain genetic diversity among populations. These two indicators allow reporting on genetic diversity in an affordable way and do not need genetic data. In Sweden, we have already demonstrated practical use of those indicators for hundreds to thousands of species using already existing data and other countries are deploying them. Okay, uh, Victor, did you have a, a video you wanted to also show and share, please? Yes, I'm going to share my screen. Okay, the, this video is shared by the government of Colombia, specifically from the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. Can you hear this? No, no we can't hear it. Mm, I'm sorry. I don't know how to share the audio. When you hit share screen, there should, when you select the video, there's a button at the bottom that says share audio as well. 
Okay, give me a moment. Of this. If you stop sharing and then. Do you see it says share audio when you? Yes. Make sure you click okay. off. Colombia has a mega Can you hear? I can hear, but now we can't see the video. <laughs> okay, 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 okay. <laughs> okay. Oh no, what happened? Colombia has a mega diverse country. There we go. Shift and okay. ambitious goals and targets for the post 2020 GDF. And genetic diversity underpins the survival of the species, which are essential elements of ecosystems and provide the contribution of nature to people. Measuring genetic diversity is not an easy task, especially in a country where the number of known species exceeds 70,000. If, if we want to conserve genetic diversity, we need to monitor it. That's why through the Humboldt Institute, Colombia is participating in the design and formulation of genetic diversity indicators. For the country, it is satisfactory to contribute to this initiative that facilitate the measurement of biodiversity with affordable and feasible indicators. The Colombian government looks forward to the result of this pilot implementation of the genetic indicators, expecting it can contribute to measure progress and guide options for the conservation of the basic, ba basic elements of life. Thank you. Bye. Okay, thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Victor. Thank you, everyone. I will just close with one minute to explain some resources available. So. The first thing is we will, some of us will be in Montreal. We will have a side event um, at the CBD COP on Saturday, December 10th at 1.15 p.m. And where we will present a latest update of the indicator deployment in these and other countries, and also have more question and answer time. And there will be lunch served uh, and some treats from some of the co-host countries, Mexico, Italy, and Sweden. We will also have an exhibit booth, booth number 409. And these are some of the people who will be present, Cristiano, Maggie, Alicia, Jessica, Ivan, myself, and Linda. We will be present at the booth and you can also look for us at the COP and ask us questions. We have resources online at the Coalition for Conservation Genetics.org and gbikegenetics.eu, where you will find policy briefs, publications, statements that we have submitted to the CBD, fact sheets, and some of the videos that you have seen here today, as well as others. And you can find our contact information and follow us on Twitter. And there are two uh, preprint papers just out, one of them on monitoring the status and trends using these genetic indicators. So to explain in more detail what you saw today. And you can also find with that article links to explore the data collection device in Kobo. And then there is a paper on uh, possible areas of improvement to the current goal and target wording and how the indicators connect to that wording and things that may be still missing from the current goals and targets with respect to genetic diversity. Thanks, Sean, and thanks everyone. So I believe that concludes our webinar for today. And as we said, we will have the recording posted and we'll be able to share with you all later. And we certainly hope to see some of you at COP15 in Montreal. So thank you again and goodbye everyone.